Hey everybody, snow day here in Annapolis. I, I hope you guys have better weather wherever you are. A lot has happened in the news in the last week since we did this episode about the uh, fixed wing and T LAM strikes into Western Yemen. So I wanted to go ahead and wait for a few things to happen. And I was also working on the Billy Mitchell episode. If you guys haven't seen that one, check it out. I'm pretty proud of how that one came out. But I want to do this as a uh, live stream format. Normally, I do these as uh, you know produced episodes, but I wanted to uh, uh, do a little Q&A and a little discussion after I go through the headlines here. So Mrs. Mooch Carey is over here working the comments moderation. So uh, be on your best behavior. If you get jettisoned, there's nothing I can do for you. But uh, we will, like I said, do the, the Q&A part after I tee up some headlines. So a lot has happened since last Saturday. Tensions between the U.S. and the Houthis have continued to flare up in and around the Red Sea since the U.S. and U.K. did those strikes on at least 30 Houthi sites in western Yemen, Yemen using Tomahawk land attack missiles, better known as TLAM, as I'm sure most of you know, and fixed wing aircraft. And this happened on January 11th. So that kind of seems like a, a long time ago now. However, this is uh, kind of, I'm reminded of this Monty Python. I'm not dead. What? Well, nothing. Here's your knife. But... I'm not dead. Yeah. He says he's not dead. Yes, he is. I'm not. So the Houthis apparently are not dead yet. So on two days after those strikes, whatever belief the Pentagon had that the strikes would stop attacks was wiped away uh, after the Houthis fired an anti-ship cruise missile towards the USS Laboon. That missile was shot down by a Super Hornet attached to Carrier Air Wing 3 aboard Eisenhower. So this is the second time that Super Hornets have been used to shoot down Houthi missiles and, and drones. In response to that Houthi missile launch, the Eisenhower Strike Group launched a second round of TLAM strikes on January 15th on four Houthi missile system sites along the Yemeni coastline. So only a few hours after that, as reported by our friends at G-Captain, the Houthis carried out a successful missile strike on the bulk carrier merchant vessel Gibraltar Eagle, owned by U.S.-based Eagle bulk shipping while transiting the Gulf of Aden. Only a few hours, I'm sorry, the following day, Maltese flagged bulk carrier merchant vessel Zagrafia, owned by Greece-based Bonnure Shipping Corporation was struck by anti-ship ballistic missiles in the Southern Red Sea. In both of these cases, there was no significant damage to the ships and the vessels were able to continue without assistance. Then on Wednesday, a Houthi missile, a Houthi missile hit the merchant vessel Genko Picardi which is a U.S. owned and operated bulk carrier ship flying under a Marshall's Island flag. The ship was sailing in the Gulf of Aden when it was struck. The crew reported no injuries and only limited damage to the gangway. And you can see that damage here. Picardi was, I'm sorry, Genko Picardi was assisted by Vishkapatnam, which is an Indian guided missile destroyer. So you see some international assistance. This is the first time I think the Indians have been involved in our coalition uh, task force here, known as Prosperity Guardian. We've talked about that before. That same day, CENTCOM released the following statement. 
in the context of ongoing multinational efforts to protect freedom of navigation and prevent attacks on U.S. and partner maritime traffic in the Red Sea, on January 17th, approximately 11.59 p.m. Sana'a time, and Sana'a is a city in western Yemen, U.S. Central Command forces conducted strikes on 14 Iran-backed Houthi missiles that were loaded to be fired in Houthi-controlled areas in Yemen. These missiles on launch rails presented an imminent threat to merchant vessels and U.S. Navy ships in the region and could have been fired at any time, prompting U.S. forces to exercise their inherent right and obligation to defend themselves. These strikes, along with other actions we have taken, will degrade the Houthi capability to continue their reckless attacks on international and commercial shipping in the Red Sea, Bob El Mandeb Strait, and Gulf of Aden. That CENTCOM statement does not identify what weapon was used, but it was most likely uh, a TLAM. Then, yesterday, CENTCOM sent out this tweet with the headline, Third Houthi Terrorist Attack on Commercial Shipping Vessel in Three Days. And it reads, On January 18th, at approximately 9 p.m. Sanaa time, Iranian-backed Houthi terrorists launched two anti-ship ballistic missiles at the merchant vessel Chem Ranger. That's the ship here. A Marshall-flagged, U.S.-owned, Greek-operated tanker ship. The crew observed the missile impact the water near the ship. There were no reported injuries or damage. The ship has continued underway. Following that, a guy we've talked about before, Houthi spokesperson Mohammed Abdul Salam took to social media and said the following, quote, on top of the 100 days of Israeli aggression against Gaza, we affirm that the hostile measures by America against Yemen will not prevent the armed forces from continuing to implement their religious, humanitarian, and moral commitment in support of the Palestinian people and their valiant resistance by continuing to target ships belonging to the enemy entity and heading to ports of occupied Palestine until the aggression stops and the siege on Gaza ends. So note that what Abdul Salam is saying here is they're only targeting ships that are either supporting Israel or American ships. And so somebody we've talked about on the channel before, Pentagon spokesperson Sabrina Singh took issue with that. And she said, what's happening in Gaza is, despite what the Houthis say, very different from what they're doing. 50 nations, some of which have no geographic location or connection to the Middle East, are being attacked by the Houthis. And then Sabrina's colleague, Major General Patrick Ryder, another guy we've talked about on the channel in a whole bunch of ways in recent episodes, when asked by members of the press corps whether the Houthi defiance is leading to the Israel-Hamas Israel war spreading across the region, exactly what the Pentagon has spent the months since October 7th trying to prevent by plussing up presence in the region. Patrick Ryder said, Major General Patrick Ryder said, despite the tensions and disruption to the Red Sea shipping, the conflict in the Middle East has stayed between Israel and Hamas. Meanwhile, speaking about the Israel-Hamas conflict, resolution of it certainly wasn't helped recently when Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said the quiet part out loud, publicly admitting that he didn't support a two-state solution with the Palestinians. That statement reportedly has widened the growing gap between the Israeli government and the Biden administration regarding how to calm tensions in the region, not to mention creating long-term stability in the Middle East. Now, another quiet part was said out loud recently when President Biden was asked by the White House press corps yesterday whether the strikes on the Houthis were working. Here is his response, and it's uh, pretty candid. The strikes in Yemen are working. Well, when you say working, are they stopping the Houthis? No. Are they going to continue? Yes. So, obviously, he's has no illusions about how, how they've worked so far. And then Sabrina Singh attempted to put a finer point on what President Biden said there by saying, our initial assessments are that we've pretty much been very successful and that we've been able to destroy all of the targets that we hit. 
or she said pretty much all of the targets that we hit. Each one is one less missile that they're able to use tomorrow. Now back to Major General Ryder's answer about whether or not the conflict was spreading. When we talk about spreading, as we've discussed on some of our current events episode in recent months, the main concern about spreading, and this is what U.S. Navy presence is all about and is designed to prevent, is that Iran would get directly involved instead of just supporting the proxies like the Houthis, Hamas, and Hezbollah. That concern grew on January 15th when the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, a branch of the Iranian Armed Forces, launched ballistic missiles at what it described as the headquarters of spies in herbal northern Iraq. At least 10 of those missiles fell near the U.S. consulate, which initially led to the belief that the Iranians had intentionally targeted Americans, which caused a lot of alarmist tweets to that effect. In a statement, the RGC said, quote, in response to the recent evil acts of the, of the Zionist regime in martyring IRGC and resistance, and resistance commanders. Now, re remember, the Israelis did a strike on IRGC targets a few weeks ago, along with American strikes on IRGC targets. In response to targets, or in, in response to the IRGC uh, or their proxies, rebel groups in Iraq targeting American outposts. So again, they say in response to the Zionist regime attack, basically the Islamic Revolution Guard Corps with its nobility and intelligence targeted and destroyed one of the main headquarters of Israel's spying agency Mossad in Iraq's Kurdistan region by firing ballistic missiles. According to State Department officials, no U.S. facilities were impacted. No coalition or American forces were killed. However, Iraqi government sources said at least four civilians were killed and six injured, injured in the attack, including prominent Kurdish businessman Peshra Desai, Peshra Desai and his baby daughter Zia, as well as the family's foreign babysitter. Coalition forces also shot down three drones near Herbal Airport, where U.S. and other international forces are stationed, which suspended air traffic from the airport. In response to the Iranian missile attack, Iraq recalled its ambassador from Tehran. Now, the plot thickens, but I want to be very clear and provide context about this particular part. So at approximately the same time of the attack on Iraq, the IRGC also launched a separate missile attack that struck targets in Syria, which Iranian, Iranian officials claimed was a direct response to the bombing in the Iranian city of Kerman earlier in the month that killed at least 94 people, as well as an attack on a police station in Rask. The Syrian civil defense, known as the White Helmets, reported that the second Iranian strike targeted a defunct medical center and left two civilians with minor injuries. So in, res in a separate missile attack, the next day, the IRGC also launched a missile strike on what it described as two bases for a militant group in Pakistan. Although Pakistani officials claimed that the strikes damaged a mosque and that two children were killed and three others wounded in the attack. And as a result of that, Pakistan countered that strike with its own attack aimed near the Iranian city of Saravan claiming that it had, quote, credible intelligence of impending large-scale terrorist activities, end quote. A Pakistani army statement said the strikes were conducted with drones, rockets, and long-range missiles and targeted the Balakistan Liberation Army and the Balakistan Liberation Front. So at this point, as I said, it's important to note these missile exchanges aren't the beginning of a war between Iran and Iraq or Iran and Pakistan, but part of a decades-long struggle in both cases. Tensions between Iran and Iraq go back decades, highlighted by the bloody eight-year war between them. And this missile exchange with Pakistan wasn't actually with the government of Pakistan, but with groups that want greater autonomy in Balakistan, a remote, a remote region in southwestern Pakistan. Both Iranian and Pakistani officials have gone to great lengths after this missile exchange. 
to state that each respects the territorial integrity of the other. In fact, they were seen in Davos together um, being very, very friendly. So as I'm saying, that this missile exchange particularly should not be viewed as a widening of the Israel-Hamas war. What is kind of happening here is under the umbrella of that kinetic situation that started on October 7th, there are wars within wars that have lit off or gone high order, as we say in the strike warfare business. Now, you can connect the dots, but it it is a little bit of an overreach to be, let's just say, alarmist at this point and say, okay, this is the Israel-Hamas war spreading across the region and stand by for World War III. That's, that's not quite what's, what's going on here. Now, the concerns are still valid. But one fact among all of this keeps jumping out, and that is Iran is the common denominator of all of this tension and these attacks across the region. So with respect to the Houthi situation, there's basically two elements to it that we need to attend to. One is we need to, and we are going to, as you heard President Biden and Major General Ryder say, continue the whack-a-mole. It's not tit for tat. It's more whack-a-mole, meaning we will preemptively take out radar facilities, missile launchers, storage depots, if it looks like they are engaged in the imminent delivery of those weapons against either prospective prosperity guardian assets or commercial shipping. And we've demonstrated that. So tit for tat is you shoot something at us, we shoot something at you. Whack-a-mole is you poke your head up, we're going to smack you. And that's Sabrina Singh's point with respect to every site we hit is one less they will have at their disposal. Okay, so, so far, they are proven to be pretty resilient after the massive strikes last Saturday that we were all, all thinking would seriously hamper um, their ability to conduct these sort of strikes. And, and they're going to great ends here to prove that that's not the case. Now, the second is cutting off the supply chain from Iran to the Houthis and the other proxies. But let's just focus on the Houthis here. And the attempt... An attempt to do that recently met with tragedy Tragedy on, on January 11th. While a SEAL team based aboard this ship here, which is the USS Lewis B. Puller, which is an expeditionary sea base, was conducting a nighttime VBSS. And VBSS stands for Vertical, I'm sorry, Vessel Boarding Search and Seizure. And I, when I was the Air Wing Ops Officer uh, back in the late 90s, I worked with SEAL teams on they're VBSSs. These are very intense missions, very challenging missions for SEAL teams. They can do them a couple of different ways. They can uh, come in low on the water in H-60s and pop up and fast rope at the last second, or they can use uh, their, their rigid hull boats and, and hull ass and throw these metal ladders on the side and climb up that way. So in this case, it looks like that's what they were, were doing. And so they were doing a VBSS against a Dow, which was trying to smuggle weapons from Iran to Yemen. At some point during the operation, reportedly conducted in rough seas, one of the SEALs was swept off the metal boarding ladder along the side of the Dow and into the sea. The second SEAL leapt from the ladder in an attempt to rescue his swim buddy. Both were lost. CENTCOM released the following statement following that tragedy. On 11 January 2024, while conducting a flag verification, which is what they call the uh, VBSS, U.S. CENTCOM Navy forces conducted a nighttime seizure of a Dow, conducting illegal transport of advanced lethal aid from Iran to resupply Houthi forces in Yemen as part of the Houthis' ongoing campaign of attacks against international merchant shipping. 
SEALs operating from the Lewis B. Puller, supported by helicopters and unmanned aerial vehicles, executed a complex boarding of the Dow near the coast of Somalia in international war- waters of the Arabian Sea, seizing Iranian-made ballistic missile and cruise missile components. And that which, that's what you see here. Um, you know, arming devices, fuses, uh, fin kits. Initial analysis indicates these same weapons have been employed by the Houthis to threaten and attack innocent mariners on international merchant ships transiting the Red Sea. And then the statement says, this is the first seizure of lethal Iranian-supplied advanced conventional weapons to the Houthis since the beginning of Houthi attacks against merchant ships in November of 2023. The interdiction also constitutes the first seizure of advanced Iranian-manufactured ballistic missile and cruise missile components by the U.S. Navy since November 2019. The direct or indirect supply, sale, or transfer of weapons to the Houthis in Yemen violates U.N. Security Resolution 2216 and international law. Then the statement says two U.S. Navy SEALs previously reported at law, as lost at sea were directly involved in this operation. This Dow was deemed unsafe and sunk by U.S. Navy forces. Disposition of the 14 Dow crew members is being determined in accordance with international law. And I'm, I'm not quite sure what that means in terms of whether they were taken into custody or they went down with the Dow. I don't know. Now, the two SEALs are still listed technically as missing by the Pentagon, and their identities have not been released. Here at the channel, our thoughts are with the families and surviving members of that SEAL team. I think everybody here at this live stream should let their loss be a reminder to all of us of the hazards of keeping these sea lanes open and why we should be thankful for those willing to take on the risks associated with this mission. You know, it's not an easy job. And folks like that SEAL team are out there every day risking everything. Now, on a lighter note, the USS Gerald R. Ford, CVN-78, pulled back into its home port of Norfolk Naval Station on January 17th after a deployment to the Med that included three extensions, as we covered in depth over that time period. Ford began its deployment last May, first operating in the North Sea, making a port call, call to Oslo before heading to the Med. Pentagon's first extension of Ford was in mid-October as a result of the October 7 Hamas attack. And as we detailed in a previous episode, they went from the Adriatic where they were assisting with the Ukrainian NATO operation and sortied to the Eastern Med where they were there for what we call presence. The Defense Department extended Ford two more times as a function of what was going on, not just in, in and around Israel and Gaza, but also some of what was happening around the Red Sea and also some of the stuff that Iran was doing with shipping coming through the, uh, the Strait of Hormuz. So the Defense Department extended Ford two more times and the Navy responded to ongoing drone and missile attacks uh, in the Red Sea, as we're talking about. So Ford was at sea for a total of 239 days. Normal deployment back in my day was 180 days. So that's a long time to be at sea. As I detailed in an episode about Ford called What $13 Billion Gets You some time ago, Ford is the lead ship in a new class of aircraft carriers, three more of which are being built. They're in various stages of completion. And uh, this class features a number of what we call next generation technologies, including EMAOS, which is the electromagnetic aircraft launch system that you see the diagram here, eliminates the requirement for steam to launch aircraft, and the AAG advanced arrest, arresting gear, which is easier to maintain, which is a big deal for air department, and also less wear and tear on airplanes as they, as they trap aboard. 
Now, a Navy press release listed some of Ford's operational statistics, and uh, they're, they're pretty noteworthy, so let me read them to you. During the deployment, the carrier conducted 33,444 flight deck moves, 3,124 hangar bay aircraft moves, 2,883 2, aircraft elevator moves, 16,351 aircraft fueling evolutions, and transferred 8,850 pallets of cargo and mail. The cooks prepped and served 3.1 million meals, which included around 48,000 dozen eggs. So do the math there, 48,000 dozen, 24,000 gallons of milk, 131,000 hamburgers, what we call sliders on the boat, 367,000 pounds of chicken, and for all you sweet tooth folks out there, 79,000 chocolate chip cookies. Again, as detailed, the air wing aboard was CAG-8, four Super Hornet squadrons, including the puking dogs. And you can see the two-seat squadron there to on the right wing of the puking dog is the Black Lions. That's the F. Not pictured here is the Growler squadron. So Super Hornet fighter attack, Growler electronic attack, E-2 Hawkeye, Airborne Early Warning, and H-60 is doing a whole host of things that we've detailed, both in the interview we did at the air show with the two COs of H-60 squadrons, and then lately when Hellfires were used to take out those Houthi boats. All right. So those are the headlines. So now Carrie's going to queue up some questions and we can have a little discussion here. So go ahead and fire away, Carrie. So this is from Mars Bandit NYC. If confirmed, how do you think Iran now having WMDs complicates Middle Eastern policy? Um, so this gets us back into the matrix that got us into the Iraq war back in 03, right? So that's a very charged term in modern history. Iran's threat is around, if you, if by WMD, you mean they have developed nuclear weapons capability, that does change the calculus. And, you know, that, that's a, that's a big move on the chessboard. What would we be willing to do in the event that that is, is revealed to be true? Um, well, it would start with sanctions and it would start with going back and forth at the United Nations. Um, you know, I, when you start talking about strikes against Iran by American forces or let's just say coalition forces now, that's, that's a big deal. That really does, in the face of everything else going on, equal World War III. Um, it's certainly within our means. I've used the illusion in recent episodes about Operation Praying Manus, and you guys may remember that episode I did with my good friend and now Muchi Award-winning Brad Penniston a few months ago about Praying Mantis and how the U.S. Navy put half the Iranian Navy on the bottom of the Persian Gulf in eight hours. So we certainly have the ability to take out their coastal defense for sure. And that includes their Air Force, which I would hate to see their Tomcats get shot down. But let's be honest, they'd be made short work against our Super Hornets and also Air Force F-35s. And if we sorted Vincent from Westpac into the Gulf, then you have F-35Cs. We take out the, the integrated air defense, you know, now putting boots on the ground and invading Iran and taking over Tehran, that's that's a tall order. Um, but the first step we, we could do. And so this is where you you raise the, the calculus and each step. It's like, okay, if you don't do the following things, dismantle your nuclear weapons capability and allow inspectors in to ensure this is happening, we will do the following. And so the strikes. And in the face of that, they pull a Saddam and are defiant and keep going. 
and let's just say call our bluff. Now that's a that's a uh, a, a tricky situation. So let's hope it doesn't come to that. Next question. Shaggy dog, shaggy T dog. That we've learned over the last couple of decades that no one can fully defeat an idea slash movement. But obviously we do need to address the harm they're causing. What's the modern approach? So I, I'm not quite sure what you mean. If you're talking about nation building against uh, you know, an Islamic state, uh, against a um, jihad, um, sh Sharia law, that kind of thing, Yes, that's that's tough, right? Winning hearts and minds uh, is is a, a, a tough mission, and we proved it in in certainly in, in Iraq, but really we did in in Afghanistan. And having spent some time on the ground there, among the locals in the wilds of Paktika province and other places, you know, it, it's the 14th century, you know. So you're like things that are our touchstones of modernity, like Hey, you guys, you could have an iPhone. They're like, what? I don't, I'm, I'm good. You know? And, and, and so what we think we're bringing to them, they don't really need so far. And, and I'll tell you, some of the shepherds and other folks we, we saw out there in places like Yosef Kel and Yaya Kel don't seem unhappy. I'll, I'll be honest. You know, they tend to their flock. They do their thing. In fact, the border is meaningless to them. In the winter, they go to Pakistan, and summer they come back to Afghanistan. So, again, the Occidental conception of lines on a map don't mean that much. So, to your point, that's a tough thing to do. Now, if it poses an existential threat, if that country or its leadership poses an ex existential threat to America or the Western world, either via WMD or what the Houthis are pulling in a major shipping choke point. Remember the 15%, as as good friend Sal um, from the What's Up with Shipping channel said um, in, uh, in the episode he was on with me, 15% of the world's shipping goes through the Bob El Mendeb Strait and through the Suez Canal. So, you know, it, we can't have that just stopped by uh, these bad actors, right? So... I hope that answered your question. Hold on for a second. <clears throat> Chris Murphy asks, do you think the Houthis have the technical skills necessary to operate these weapons, please? So which weapons are we talking about? The ones they have um, or the ones they could get? I, I, I what is it, Sun Tzu that says, never underestimate your enemy? Um, I, I'd watch dismissing them as as you know just just uh, these rebels and and uh, tribal uh, Byzantine guys out there. Uh, you know, I, I think they've proved that they can definitely hit commercial shipping. You know, and they're targeting using signals intelligence. They have the means to track ships, know which ones they're shooting at. Um, obviously, they can track and target. American ships, Laboon's been targeted, Mason's been targeted. Um, and this is our fear that it's only a matter of time until one of those missiles hits and has a warhead big enough to pull a USS Stark kind of thing, you know, and uh, that's what we're trying to avoid. So they're not MIT grads, but they're certainly able to harass to the degree that they have. You know, they've stopped shipping. They rerouted for a time Maersk and some other shipping lines around South Africa instead of trying to go through the ditch. So regardless of how competent or how bleeding edge they are with their technology, right? They only have one F5, apparently, according to that propaganda uh, video they made a few weeks ago. Um, they are competent enough that uh, we need to pay attention. Walter Broadus, good to see you. Are we still operating under the use of force resolution of 2001? Is it time for Congress to authorize these current activities under the War Powers Act? So remember, Walter, the War Powers Act is a presidential power. Um, and, and so 
he has executed his these strikes under the War Powers Act. And then in whatever passage of time it is, what is it, it's 60 days if we're still engaged in, in hostilities or we have a, a persistent presence, then he has to go to Congress and ask for permission to continue that. Now, some more vocal uh, political stunt members of Congress have, have said he's violating the War Powers Act. Uh, he, he is not. And, and I don't mean Republicans. I mean progressives. Are, are are very angry at uh, President Biden for for doing these strikes, but he's he's completely within his power under the War Powers Act to do what he what he uh, what he's done. Now, the u- use of force resolution in two thousand one. I'm not specifically familiar with uh, uh, with with what that states. So Phil says the Marshall Amp is a directed energy weapon. That is true, and you guys may also note that. I have a new guitar here. Uh, it's sort of Santa adjacent in SG. So you guys who are familiar with the SG. You know that we're jamming on some Black Sabbath and some ACDC. Great guitar. So I, I, I have all my Gibsons displayed here. Les Paul Jr., Les Paul Standard, which is my favorite. Well, it's it's the my go-to and uh, the SG. But yes, I love this this Marshall amp and head. It's fantastic. All right, Captain America. Ward, what do you think about the Coast Guard operating in the Far East and the Middle East? Can't the Navy handle it? I, I totally love that Coast Guard cutters are part of these task forces out there. Um, and the answer is, this is a force multiplier. The the What those Coast Guard cutters at, at with these highly competent Coast Guard crews, these guys are the real deal. The Coast Guard is no B team. And when I was working at the Naval Institute, I was able to see this firsthand. Uh, and the, the talented folks who are on everything from the the Eagle training, uh, you know, tall ship on down to the fast boats that operate around this, the rivers and, and, and tributaries to their they're cutters and, and icebreakers. They do amazing work. And whether it's, you know, disaster relief where they'll get, you know, people who are trapped in the middle of a hurricane off of the roof of a flooded building and these kind of things. So it's not that the Navy can't handle it. It's that the Coast Guard has a capability that's relevant to the mission. And I support it 100%. MG307 asks, can Iran successfully close the Strait of Hormuz? Uh, well, I, I, they can threaten to do so. They can redirect shipping. So history has shown they, they can impede traffic, if not stop it. Uh, and that's why Ike uh, and, and the Eisenhower Strike Group didn't stop in the Eastern Med. They kept going because Iran was threatening shipping taking ships, kidnapping crews and and harassing shipping. And as soon as Eisenhower got to the other side of Suez, they knocked that off. Um, but that's always there. So I think temporarily uh, they could close the Strait of Hormuz, but that would be a temporary situation. Um, the, the threat is that they would impede shipping going through that choke point coming out of, you know, there's some major oil. Um, um, routes that come out of the Persian Gulf into the various places it goes. Can the growlers scramble their signals or are these dumb missiles? Uh, so that starts to get in classified stuff. So let's just say there are uh, more than just growlers, but there are other assets in the strike group uh, that have the means uh, to use directed energy to to take down things like drones. And I'll just leave it at that. Mm. Our good friend, Chris Darling asks, how much shipping has been decreased through the Suez Canal? Uh, So at the height of the Houthi hijinks, Chris, it was 15%. Um, And and so that starts to be 
as Sal and I discussed, that starts to affect uh, world markets. Um, there were some shippers that that there are companies that were like, I don't care, we're going, and we have no beef with the Houthis, and we have nothing to do with this war. And in some cases, as Sabrina Singh pointed out, they were targeted anyway, but they were confident that they were safe going through there. But the other either, and you can see it gets pretty complicated, you know, Panamanian flagged, American owned, Greek manned, you know, Greek crew, that kind of stuff. And this as a consequence of that DNA, if you will, it starts to involve a lot of nations, something that we pointed out with Sal when he was on the channel. Um, that's why people care. It's not just America versus the world here. Um, so the effect was significant is the bottom line there, Chris. Chris. Studio Play asks, do you think that the Houthis would slash are able to resort the non-conventional warfare tactics, chemical, biological, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, well, I don't think we've heard any evidence of chem bio. Um, I'm sure that the Iranians could supply them with that, uh, but we haven't seen that yet. Like we're asking about if WMD is revealed to be an imminent threat in Iran, if the Houthis are threatening to use chem bio against either shipping or against Saudi or UAE or whatever, uh, that certainly ups the threat and, and we would do more deliberate and uh, punitive, let's just say, actions that would make what we did on January 11th look uh, kind of uh, simple. Um, can you just keep on going? Yeah, so I'll, let me see. William asked, since we got Carrie working the gains here, how is your wife's health? I pray for her to quickly heal. God bless. So Carrie's doing great, right? Her, she went to PT and her wrist is almost hundred percent, right? Yep. Almost hundred percent. Um, so thanks William for that, for, for asking. It's very nice of you uh, to do so. Um, but she's, she's doing great working out regularly. And, uh, she works, I've mentioned before at the alumni, so the Naval Academy Alumni Association serving uh, the members there. And so she's, she's almost hundred percent. Let's just call it 95%. All right, let's do a couple more. Um, let's, see. Well, let's see what Chris Chris says here. Chris Frederick says the Houthi strategy is ex the exact same as Hamas to invoke to invoke an overreaction, not to win. I think that's a, a good point. Um, and so, what we have to watch is playing into their hands. This was the knock on both of our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, which is this is what bin Laden wanted from the outset, was to get the Western world, particularly America, at the cost of a lot of blood and treasure, involved in a war that was unwinnable. And this is something in the case of Afghanistan that Alexander the Great proved was a bad idea way back in the day. And so nothing has changed since that time. So we do have to ensure that we react, if not proportionally, in a way that doesn't overreach and get us involved in a way that we did in Iraq and particularly in Afghanistan, where, you know, you show up in 2003, you leave in 2020, what was it, 21, 22, when we did this Samari pull out of, of Kabul. and. We're back to the beginning. And as a guy who's seen what the Afghan Air Force, what the Afghan National Army, the Afghan National Police were trying to do in terms of propping up a fledgling democracy, willing to risk their lives, their families, their security, and then it just all goes to nothing and the Taliban flow back in, um, that that's unsat, right? So we cannot repeat that just like we've done in other places like Vietnam. So, you know, at the same time, this activity cannot go uh, unchecked that the Houthis are doing particularly. And uh, we have to make sure that Iran does not pose any more of a regional threat, global threat than they already do. So 
We'll keep our eye on the situation in terms of whether we're reacting proportionally, but I think so far we are. Now, let's talk about one other thing while we're talking about that. The financial ledger is way out of balance, like it was in all the post-9-11 conflicts, right? You take out a $15,000 Datsun with a $2 million JDAM, and you do that over and over again. And we've gone through the economics of SM2s versus suicide drones, same deal with JDAM, TLAM, so forth and so on, even a Sidewinder versus a, a, a drone, right? That's like a million dollars versus $20,000. Uh, so that's something that, trust me, the bean counters in the Pentagon are tracking. And this is why in time we stop doing presence and start doing full up hot war. This is why Operation Southern Watch ended and we created Iraqi freedom. That's a simplistic narrative, but Southern Watch was working. I was there. Um, and we had the Iraqis at parade rest. However, it was very, very expensive. And I, this is Vice President Cheney said as much. Uh, he said the quiet part out loud. So we will keep our eye on the economics of presence, but it is in time an effective strategy, in my opinion. James Herod asked, any mention of another carrier group coming into theater? Uh, yeah, but not in the short term, um, right? Ford just got home. Um, Harry S. Truman is on the step, I believe. Um, maybe there's another one before that. We got to keep our eye on China as well. So that's where Reagan is permanently deployed and Vincent is currently uh, hanging out in the Western Pacific at this time. All right. Uh, I think that'll do it. Thanks to Kerry for being the moderator here. Thanks to everybody for showing up on a Friday afternoon. Uh, another good crowd here. And as always, uh, this episode will be a regular episode as soon as we sign off here. So if you missed it, including if you want to take a look at the comments, which are always a value add uh, that you missed during the live stream, then please do so. As always, if you're not a subscriber, please become one so you don't miss anything. We're going to be covering this situation as well as other things. Uh, I'm actually going aboard uh, Ford at the end of this month. I'm going to sit down with our good friend, uh, Admiral Verissimo, and talk about what Ford did on deployment. Also, there's some other breaking news about the org chart of Airland that I, I can't speak about yet, but we'll talk to Admiral Verissimo about that other things going on. Uh, another teaser for something that's going to happen in a few months, I'm going to go aboard Harry S. Truman in April uh, with our good friend Hoser Miller. Uh, to do uh, a couple days out there uh, with with those guys. And uh, I haven't done an episode aboard the ship. Uh, so, you know, standard stuff on the flight deck, cat shots, ready room hanging out with the Bubba's, wardroom one, eating sliders, LSO platform where Hoser will be very comfortable. Go on the bridge, go, go to Pry Fly, go to the mess decks, go down to the maintenance spaces, check out AMD in the hangar bay. We're going to do all that. So that's coming up in a, in a couple months. I'm very much looking forward to that. So. The bottom line is a lot going on on the channel. So if you're not a subscriber, become one. So you don't miss anything. I appreciate your support. I appreciate the support of my patrons. I see some of my patrons here. We're going to circle up in just over an hour for our weekly happy hour on Zoom. So if you're not a patron, you might want to check it out. It's at patreon.com slash Ward Carroll. Give me a dollar. Give me $100. Give me whatever you can afford and join our crew these folks are uh, the brain trust of the channel. And uh, I really enjoy talking to everybody every week. So that happens uh, on Fridays at 5 Eastern. So we're about to do that. And uh, thanks for everything else that you guys bring to the channel. And as I said, stay tuned. All right. Talk to you guys again very soon.